Hey everyone, this is Wes, and in this video I'm going to give a brief overview of serial communication. So serial communication is a very broad form of communication, and it can be loosely defined as the sequential transmission of bits one at a time via some shared medium. In modern times, serial communication takes place in the digital domain, but you could think of it starting out in the physical domain. One example of the physical domain would be uh, binary smoke signaling, where you create some fire or other smoke source, and then you move something over the top of the fire in a pattern, changing the duration each time that signals something to somebody that's far away but close enough to see the smoke. And another example of the physical domain would be something like Morse code. There are two main forms of digital communication. There is serial communication, which usually consists of a single bit being transmitted at a time, and then there's parallel communication, which always consists of multiple bits being transmitted at a time. Serial communication has several pros and cons associated with it. It requires fewer wires and connections to be made when compared to parallel communication, and it allows for smaller devices with lower pin counts and less energy consumption to be employed. If you can use a lower pin count device, then you'll save money on your project or product, and if you can use a device that is more power efficient, the system will be able to run longer in some battery powered application, for example. Serial buses are also not affected by noise as much as parallel buses. Crosstalk between signals in a parallel bus is a critical issue when you start getting into higher data rates. The main downside to serial communication is that in most common use cases, a higher data rate could be achieved with parallel communication. The two general categories of serial communication are asynchronous and synchronous. Asynchronous serial protocols require a common data rate to be used by the two entities that wish to communicate. In addition, start and stop signals are often used to indicate the beginning and the end of a transmission. Synchronous serial protocols use a dedicated signal for synchronization that's shared between two entities and controls the rate at which data is transmitted and received. The signal is often called a clock signal. Unlike the synchronous protocols, asynchronous protocols do not use a shared clock signal for communication synchronization. Instead, they ensure that the entities trying to communicate transmit and receive at the same data rate, or as close to the same as possible. As long as the transmitter sends data at the agreed upon rate, the receiver can properly sample and interpret the data. This shared rate is called the baud rate, which is typically expressed in bits per second. An early example of an asynchronous communication protocol is the 20 milliamp current loop, where bits are represented by pulses of current instead of a voltage logic level. A logical 1 is represented by a pulse of 20 milliamps of current, and a logical 0 is represented by no current. RS-232 is an extremely well-known asynchronous protocol, where large non-zero voltage levels are used to represent zeros and ones. The next example of asynchronous communication would be the Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, aka a UART. UARTs are universal serial components that can be used to implement some variety of different protocols. They typically use non-negative DC voltages to represent digital values. A logical one is represented by a positive DC voltage, usually whatever the logic level of device you're interfacing with. So common ones are 3.3 volts, 5 volts, etc and a logical zero is represented by a zero DC voltage. UARTs don't have as many strict guidelines and are easier to set up and get working compared to other asynchronous protocols. Synchronous protocols use a clock signal that's shared between two entities that controls the rate at which data is transmitted and received. This clock signal is typically controlled by the transmitter. The rising or falling edges of the clock signal dictate when data should be clocked into the receiving entity. It may help to think about how digital flip-flops work. Data on the input is stored to the output when a specific transition of the clock signal occurs. So receiving devices use flip-flops internally as a method of storing received data. Since there's a dedicated signal for synchronization, synchronous protocols tend to have higher data rates than asynchronous protocols. The first example of a synchronous communication protocol we'll discuss is the Serial Peripheral Interface, aka SPI. An SPI port is usually comprised of at most four signals. The first signal is the chip select, which tells a receiving device when it should start storing the transmitted data. As you can see in the diagram, the chip select is active or low while only data is being transmitted. The next two signals are data input and output signals. 
The first is master out, slave in, commonly called Mosi, and the second is master in, slave out, commonly called Miso. Mosi is the data being transmitted from a master device to a slave device, and Miso is the data that's being received by the master from a slave device. The last signal is the clock, which dictates when each data bit is valid and can be stored by the receiving device. The next synchronous communication protocol we will discuss is inter-integrated circuit, aka I2C or I2C. An I2C port is comprised of two signals. The first signal is serial data, which is bidirectional and is where the data is propagated. The second signal is the serial clock, and just like SPI, this clock signal tells the receiving device when each data bit is valid. Multiple master and slave devices can share the same bus, which is a powerful feature but it requires a more complicated protocol to make sure there are no bus contentions. Each slave device has a slave address associated with it, and this is what allows the bus to be shared by multiple devices. In conclusion, serial communication protocols are used all over the place in embedded systems, and here's some examples. If you have a complex system that requires multiple microcontrollers, UARTs can often be used to communicate between them. Interfacing microcontrollers with a computer such as a desktop or a laptop can often be very rewarding for debugging or logging some applications. Sensors such as analog to digital converters, accelerometers, gyroscopes, etc. almost always use some form of serial communication. Usually SPI and I2C specifically are used to read data from these types of sensors. And SPI is commonly used as well for external memory devices such as ROMs. Some more examples are LCDs and wireless communication. With wireless communication, you're often using a microcontroller that itself is not capable of this. So you have an external device that you transmit data to via UART or some other protocol that then transmits the data wirelessly. So overall, serial communication is something that anyone learning about embedded systems will need to know. And deciding which protocol to use in certain applications is an important skill to have.